When I was in college, I worked at a comedy club, okay? And it was, uh, it was owned by this guy named Freddie DeMarco. He was 100% New York Italian, and he owned a bar in the middle of Missouri. It seemed a little <laughs> witness protection type stuff, but... <laughs> You know, nobody asked questions. Freddie was good to me. He treated me like a son. He was a mentor to me. In my senior year of college, I went to him. I said, Fred, I think when I graduate, I want to be a stand-up comedian. He's like, hey, Craig, I don't know, man. <laughs> You're a wrestler, man. You're a wrestler. You know, like, uh, comedy and wrestling, Greg, they're very different things. I'm like, yeah, Fred, I wasn't planning on wrestling the audience. Like, I, uh, uh, let me make a couple of calls, Greg. I can't promise you anything. I don't know. And then he did. He's a really cool guy. He, he, he set me up with a job in Chicago, and he was going to get me introduced in the Chicago club scene. But I told you guys, I took that job at Procter & Gamble. I chickened out, you know? And I had to tell Freddie. Like, Freddie, I took a job at Procter & Gamble. Craig, what, what are you, why would you do it? Man, you're going to be bored, Greg. You're going to be... I just fell asleep between the words Procter and Gamble. <laughs> No, Fred, it's a good job. They're giving me a company card. Yeah, they're giving me a company card, right? That's how they trick you to being bored. You really want to sell soap the rest of your life? I'm like, I'm not selling soap. I'm actually selling peanut butter. <laughs> <laughs> oh, why didn't you say so, Greg? I mean, that's an entirely different situation there. Yeah. Here I think you're selling soap, but you're selling peanut butter. That's gonna be a lot of excitement, Greg. I mean, think all the fun you're gonna have with peanut butter. I mean, creamy one day, crunchy the next day. Greg, get in your company car and drive it off a cliff. <laughs> At least you'll have five seconds of fun before you hit the ground. Here we come on. I, did, I worked there for 10 years, and I told you guys, I loved it. I told you guys I did, but I could never get comedy out of the back of my head, and one day I did a crazy thing. Like, I went into my boss's office, and I just quit, and uh, Freddie was my first call, because I knew he was the only one that would understand. I go, Freddie, I did it. I quit P&G. I'm going full-time comedy. Craig, why would you do that? That's a good job, man. They gave you a company car. <laughs> you said it was boring. I said that a long time ago, Greg. I mean, you're not a young guy now. I mean, your life's almost over. You're supposed to be bored, Greg. I mean, get, get, a, get a hobby. Play golf or something. You don't quit your job. I mean, comedy is a tough business, Greg. I mean, people don't need comedy, Greg. You know what they need? Peanut butter. They need peanut butter. There's a lot of stability in peanut butter, Greg. I tell you what, you know. Use your head. I mean, come on. I still talk to Freddie probably twice a month. I love him, you know. Um, but I hear him every day in the back of my head. That's the voice... You guys have a voice when you mess something up, you just, that's Freddie. When you regret something, I woke up the other day and I was like, ah, I don't feel good. Yeah, of course you don't feel good, Greg. You ate an entire rotisserie chicken at 11.30 at night. <laughs> you shoved the whole thing in your fat face in six minutes, Greg. I think you ate the rubber band that holds a legs together. I mean, come on. <laughs> Greg, you get hungry, have a snack. Don't eat an entire barnyard animal. I mean, those things are made for a family of five, not one man standing naked in the front of the refrigerator at 11.30 at night, shoving chickens into his fat face, rubbing chicken grease over God knows what. You make me sick. I, I, I hope you saved the wishbone. You're going to break it apart and wish you were somebody with self-respect. <laughs> I want to be clear, that, that's not Freddie, that's me talking to myself. Like that's, this is what goes on in my head every day. I, I, I should probably talk to somebody. I, I should get some help. I, don't know. I could get help, I could, like, I, I didn't tell you guys, I have health insurance, like, I have it, I have it, and I pay a lot. Like, it goes up every year. I didn't even do anything to those guys last year, and it, like, I pay a lot for health insurance, you know, and, uh, but guess what they give me? A card. I, I got a health insurance card. It's great, man. It's plastic, full on plastic. It's uh, flexible. It's very nice. But I mean, for what I'm paying, I want more than a plastic card. I want like a guy. I want a full time health guy just to follow me around in case something comes up. I'll be at Walgreens. Mr. Warren, what coverage do you have? Tell him about it, Tony. my guy. Pick up some toothpaste, Tony. I'll be in the car. I got a guy. 
every time I call my health insurance company, the first thing they say is, what's your group number? <laughs> well, I didn't know I was in a group. But <laughs> I'm definitely not getting a group discount. Like, what group did you put me in? I'm guessing by how much you're charging me, you put me in a group with some very unhealthy people. Like, <laughs> I want to meet the group. I want to meet them. I want to go to the group meeting. I think my group is going to be me, some guy eating a mashed potato sandwich, <laughs> that monkey that smokes cigarettes in the North Korean zoo, <laughs> and a corpse. That's my group right there. <laughs> We're not an insurable group. It's a, My health insurance company is called Cigna. You know, Cigna. Yeah. I've noticed a lot of these health insurance companies end in the letters N-A. You know, it's like Cigna, Aetna, Humana. That stands for, hey, is this covered? Nah. <laughs> I have Cigna bronze. That, you know, that's, that's my insurance package or whatever. That's my level. And it sounds pretty good. You know, like bronze... That's third place in the Olympics. Um, <laughs> but my insurance would be third place in the Olympics if there were three guys in the Olympics. Like I, in the insurance game, bronze means the worst. Like I, I, every time I use it, I hear Freddie in the back of my head. Hey, put that card away, man. Why don't you show him your blockbuster video card? It's going to be better than that. Come on, Frank. Yeah, You should have kept selling peanut butter. You might have silver. I mean, I tried to use it. I call this, this podiatrist. You know, I go, hey, uh, I got to see Dr. Fisser. They were like, uh, Dr. Fisser does not take bronze level insurance. I was like, okay, I'll just go somewhere else. They're like, no, 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 we have a doctor here that does take bronze level insurance. I was like, wait a minute. Different doctors within the same practice take different levels of insurance? I'm betting that means they are different levels of doctors. <laughs> And I'm not getting the good one, am I? <laughs> my podiatrist is just gonna be some guy who's like licking my feet, you know, just <laughs> playing this little piggy. <laughs> hey, what are you doing, man? Hey, sorry, brother, you're bronze. What did you expect, a real doctor? <laughs> I'm the custodian, man. <laughs> By the way, you know, like podiatrist, that seems like a, like a, that just seems weird. Like, you went to like 12 years of college and you just want to look at feet? <laughs> what percentage of podiatrists do you think are foot weirdos? I, I would say right around 100. Like, <laughs> and if you're a foot weirdo, you have a lot of options in this world. If you're a foot weirdo and you did well in school, podiatrist. If you're a foot weirdo and you flunked out, foot locker. Like it, it, <laughs> I talk about this stuff. Uh, I had some health stuff a while ago. It, it wasn't like overly serious, but it was, it, it was bothering me. I had some stomach problems, okay? And I went to the doctor, it was a good doctor, and he gave me some pills and it didn't work. And I went to like two more doctors, they gave me pills, gave me tests, nothing worked. And I started getting depressed. And my friend was like, hey, you should go see a holistic doctor. I'm like, oh, are you talking about like, woo? <laughs> I'm not going to see a witch, okay? And then my stomach hurt for six more weeks and I was like, I'm going to see the witch. And, and I went, and like, I didn't know what to expect. I'd never been to a witch before. Right off the bat, it was different. She goes, call me by my first name. Call me Dr. Olivia. I was like, that does not sound official to me. Like if I was in court and I heard for the prosecution, district attorney, Randy, I'd be like, no, no this guy, this guy is not a real prosecutor. You know? But here's the thing, I'll call Dr. Olivia whatever she wants me to call her, because she is a miracle worker, okay? She healed me. You want to go nicknames? What up, gut fixer? Like, I, I love, I love Dr. Olivia. She changed my life. Now, I need to tell you, witches, they charge. Like, she's expensive. Like, witches charge, and I should have known, because every time I walk in this place, there's like three pretty girls standing behind this nice desk. Greg Warden, it is so nice to see you. Oh, this is gonna cost me. Uh, it, pretty girls being nice to you? That's usually very expensive. Like, 
I've been to the regular doctor. That is not how it works. You walk in, they slide a window open about a half an inch. Sit down, fill out the forms. If you have any questions, call your mama. You're like, oh. She doesn't sound nice or pretty. Like she, she sounds like a $12 copay. I can afford this. Yeah. So Dr. Olivia charges, you know, it's just she does. But I was like, okay, I, I got insurance, let's give it a whirl. So I, I send it to Cigna and they're like, <laughs> she's a witch. I'm like, she's a good witch, okay? She's like Stevie Nicks. They won't pay her, they won't pay her. Now, Part of the reason they won't pay her is Dr. Olivia did not go to med school. Just hear me out. By training, she is a chiropractor, okay? But she spent 15 years learning as much as she could about advanced gut health, and it worked. I went to the med school guys. She beat them in a stomach fixing contest, okay? Fair and square. I don't care if she learned it at clown college. It worked, you know? They won't pay her, they won't pay her, and it's killing me. I gotta pay her, and I gotta pay the insurance company and not use the insurance, and I'm going broke, and I think the only solution is, I'm just gonna have to pay for Dr. Olivia to go to med school. It's gonna be cheaper, like, <laughs> she's not gonna wanna go. I'm like, you go, Olivia, you go. And if I'm paying, I wanna see your grades every week. <laughs> Greg, you're not following your diet. Well, you got a D in ankle class, Olivia. I don't know what med school classes are like. I assume it's body parts. <laughs> I mean, I, I, here's the thing. I, I bet you in 20 years, they're, they're going to pay for that stuff. The insurance company will catch up. It's like back in the day, they were probably like, anesthesiology? We don't pay for that. We pay for the pint of whiskey and the stick that you bite down on, and that's it. <laughs> And I gotta pay, I gotta pay for others. I gotta pay for these, these uh, probiotics. You know what that is? It's like probiotics. There's a war in my stomach <laughs> between good bacteria and bad bacteria. And I'm sure you've heard wars cost money. You know, like, and <laughs> my good bacteria costs a hundred bucks a bottle. <laughs> but here's the good news. Like I, I, I read the bottle. Each pill on the bottle contains 360 billion colony forming units. So per colony, very affordable. I, I, I'm getting a deal. I'm getting a deal on these colonies. I, 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 yeah, I, I tip her, hey, here's an extra 50. Thanks for the colony. Okay, so you guys can tell I'm, I'm a big fan of holistic medicine now. I'm a believer, but I need to warn you, okay? Be careful. Like, holistic medicine encompasses a lot of stuff. Like over here, you have Dr. Olivia, proven stomach fixer, okay? <laughs> Over here, you have some idiot on YouTube. Hey, if you get a cold, don't take cold medicine. Chop up some onions, chop up some garlic, wrap it around your feet with saran wrap, put a sock over it, go to bed, wake up, no cold. That's a real video, all right? And I did it. I, 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 I did it. It's embarrassing for six months. Like, I, I did it probably 12 times a lot. It was, I know, I, I just got carried away. And, like, I, 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 I travel every week, okay? You know how hard it is to cut an onion with an ink pen in a hotel room? Like, it, and the grocery stores close early. Like, sometimes I'm doing a show late. I gotta go buy a bag of Funyuns at the hotel gift shop, <laughs> crunch them up, and... I, I, I don't know, and I get up to go to the bathroom in the middle of the night. I, was, I, I got up one night, you know how hard it is to walk on onions and garlic and saran wrap? I, I, I fell down, I fell down, okay, and there was a full length mirror and I saw myself, it was ugly. It was very pale skin um, and underwear and uh, onions and garlic all over the place. And all I could hear was, what are you doing, man? You're walking around with a soup starter kit on your feet. I've ne only re recently started taking responsibility for my happiness. That's something I've learned. You can take responsibility for your happiness. Never done it before, never really taken responsibility for that kind of thing. My agent said to me, actually, she said, uh, the only person who can stop Josh Pugh at the minute is Josh Pugh. 
And my first thought was, oh, great, there's another comedian out there called Josh Pugh. <laughs> it's fucking typical, that is. <laughs> but I thought, if I'm going to have a kid, if I'm going to bring a child into the world, I, I need to take responsibility for my happiness. I want to be a ha happy, up, positive person. Because I'm not always, and sometimes I get quite down, and sometimes I get a lot of intrusive thoughts. So I decided to go to the doctor about this and tell the doctor about it. Now, I don't go to the doctors very often, so when I do, I just give him everything that's wrong with me. And in no particular order at all. I'm just like, help me, right? And I go in, I'm just really honest. I go, Doctor, uh, me and my wife went to Whitby on holiday recently. And I don't know if you know Whitby, but there's very high cliffs in Whitby. And the whole time I was there, I kept getting intrusive thoughts to jump off the cliff, jump off the cliff, jump off the cliff. Then one night, Doctor, me and my wife were walking along the pier, and I see an old couple kind of leaning up the pier, eating fish and chips. And I very vividly imagine clotheslining the old couple <laughs> off that pier. And I'm clearly seeing them in my mind falling and smashing against the rocks and their elderly, blooded, frail bodies in the fish and the chips just washing into the ocean. <laughs> and do you think this is athlete's foot? <laughs> it's a bit red on the side there, I don't know if you could see that. And he talks me through it um, and he says, look, the best thing for me to try would be uh, CBT. Heard of this? Cognitive Behavioural Therapy. Now, when I do CBT, it's all on the phone, right? So week one, the guy phones me up, his name's Gareth. Week one, he phones me up, he goes, uh, Josh, uh, the thing to remember with CBT is, I am not the therapist, you are the therapist. And I was like, uh, OK, Gareth, well, what seems to be the problem? <laughs> yeah. He's like, no, he's like, no that's, that's not what I mean. I was like, mate, if you're not going to open up, this is never going to work, is it? Leave your ego at the door and let's get you sorted because you're struggling, mate, ain't you? You're struggling. <laughs> now, you get 12 free sessions on the NHS of CBT. Uh, week two, Gareth finds out that I do stand-up comedy. Uh, weeks two to 12 is Gareth asking me about stand-up comedy. Uh, specifically, tell me how much he loves a comedian, Russell Kane. Every week he's going on, oh, we love Russell Kane, Josh, in our house. We think he's brilliant. He's absolutely fine. Look, I'm not even headlining my own therapy session here. It's <laughs> Every week he's going on, and the worst thing is, he's working from home, he's bringing his wife into it, he's like, oh, we love Russell Kane, Josh, we think he's brilliant, he's absolutely fantastic. Have you ever met Russell Kane? I was like, yeah, I've met Russell Kane, nice guy. He's a nice guy, love, apparently, Russell. <laughs> we knew he would be, Josh, he comes across lovely on that TV. I tell you what, we went to see him last year, where was it? Is it De Montford, love, in Leicester? Do, no, it's year before. I tell you what, what a show that lad puts on, Josh, unbelievable. We actually love what he does, we think he's fantastic, we love what he does. Uh, what kind of stuff do you do? And I was like, well... I just kind of do, like, semi-surreal, rambly stories that just sort of tail off at the end. <laughs> yeah, no, it was that lovely. No, we'll leave that, actually, Josh. But it was good, Gareth, i tell you what, good at his job. Very good at his job. Taught me a lot. Taught me about these intrusive thoughts. Taught me that we all get them. We all get these bad thoughts. Does it mean you're a bad person? Does it mean you're going to act on them? But we all get them. This is one I get. I don't know if you can relate to this. You know when, you know when something really bad's happened in your family? Maybe, maybe your granddad's been taken to hospital and it's really upsetting and it's really stressful. Whatever plans you had for that day are up in the air. It's a very overwhelming day, right? At some point during all that, I will get this thought. We might get to have a takeaway tonight. <laughs> I'm not proud of it, but it comes. And I tell you what, it comes too early as well. I've had it before, it's been put in the back of the ambulance. I'm like, we ain't had a Chinese for ages, have we? <laughs> get the menus out the drawer. Yeah, mine, there you go. All the best. Text when you get there. He's a, he's a good guy, my granddad. He's, he's, a good, he's a good dad. I think that, that's what I want to do. I want to take a bit of the, the, the best bits of the male role models from my life, add my own flavour, and that's how I'll be a dad to my little boy. My granddad is a great dad to my mum, great granddad to me. He's like me, he's a people pleaser. He's like me, he's a people pleaser. I've said that about myself for years, I'm a people pleaser. Quite a cocky thing to say about yourself, actually, when you think about it, isn't it? I'm a people pleaser. I just can't help but bring joy to everybody. That's my curse. <laughs> But he is, he says, like, he told me he's got one wish for his funeral. His only request for his funeral, he wants a song My Way to be played at his funeral. I was like, I don't think Limp Biscuit's the right vibe, but I'll, I'll go with it. 
He's like, no, no, I want the song Frank Sinatra my way. I'm like, OK, Grandad, you, you want the song My Way by Frank Sinatra to be played at your funeral? Yeah. The song My Way about doing the things you want to do when you want to do it in spite of all opposition, stick it to your guns, doing the things you want to do when you want to do it, that song My Way. He's like, yeah. I was like, Grandad, with the greatest of respect, you worked for the council for 45 years. <laughs> Nan chooses all of your outfits, all of your meals, everything you watch on TV. What is it you think you've done your way, exactly? <laughs> With the greatest of respect. He's like, no, no, I just want it played as the curtain goes round the coffin. I was like, I thought you was having a burial. Yeah, but your mum thinks we'd be better off with the cremate. That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> got, uh, I've got a stepdad as well. Not easy being a stepdad. Not, not as fun as the pornos make it look. I tell you that, it's difficult. <laughs> It's not all casting couches and fake taxes, I tell you that, it's, it's, it's graft. When you first kind of uh, moved in with us, my stepdad, he, he gave me and my sister this talk. He said, listen, kids, I'm not here to replace your real dad. And we were like, well, what the fuck are you here for, then? <laughs> you just moved in with a random family. <laughs> we need school shoes, pal. Get your own in your pocket. You've got a job on here. But he was great. I take a bit of what my, my stepdad did, and I've got a phrase. My stepdad used to have this phrase that he'd, he'd say, whenever I'd done something wrong, I don't know if your parents ever used this on you, but whenever I did anything wrong as a kid, he'd always say, I'm not angry, I'm just disappointed. You hear that one? I'm not angry, I'm just disappointed. And I would think, good. <laughs> what a relief that is. <laughs> I would take disappointment over anger any day of the week. No one's ever killed anybody in a fit of disappointment, have they? <laughs> if I said to you guys, as an audience, I've got two pit bulls backstage. <laughs> one of them's angry. <laughs> the other one's disappointed. <laughs> I'd release one into the town, or which one do you want? <laughs> disappointed one. He's a good boy. We'll cheer him up. <laughs> but what, what I'll add to the, to the mix, so I'll take all those things from the, the male role models of my life. The other thing I'll add, which maybe other men in my family don't do, I'm, I'm very good at talking about my feelings. I'm quite open about my feelings. My dad won't do it. My dad doesn't do that. What, what my dad does with his emotions, I don't know if anyone else's parents or dad or uncles do this, but what he'll do, he'll take all his anxieties, all his worries, all his concerns about the world and the future, and just consolidate all of those as anger, which he'll then channel towards one celebrity <laughs> that he's chosen to hate for seemingly no reason whatsoever. And every time that celebrity comes on the TV, he just fucking lets them have it. <laughs> Stephen Mulhern, in my dad's case. <laughs> Poor bloke's done absolutely nothing wrong. Every time he comes on the TV, oh, this prick again, he's everywhere, he is. <laughs> he's haunting me, haunting me. But that's what he'll do, he'll displace. He, he, won't, he won't talk about it, he'll displace. I get back from school one day, right? My dad's in the garden, topless, bonfire, just burning stuff. Just burning his own possessions. My mum goes, oh, your dad's not communicating. I'm like, he's fucking telling you something, isn't he? Read between the lines, things are on fire. I think he's having a bad time. He, uh, he spoke about his feelings to me once, my dad. Opened up to me once. Um, Worst day of my life, wish I'd have asked. <laughs> they keep in for a reason, these blokes. I, I, I can tell you he's a bit off, right? And I go, uh, are, you, are you OK, Dad? He goes, no, not really, son, no. I'm like, oh, what's the matter? He goes, oh, we had you and your sister too young. <laughs> OK, here we go. Here we go. He's like, yeah, we had you and your sister too young. It meant I had to work every hour, God sent to put food on the table. That meant that me and your mum spent less and less time together, more time apart, and ultimately that led to the breakdown of our marriage and divorce and huge financial upheaval and the stress of that. And that's not to mention the psychological effects it'll have on you and your sister probably into late adulthood. And I've just got so many regrets. <laughs> I was like, oh. <laughs> I was like, ooh. Um, that Stephen Mulhern's a bit of a dickhead, Dad, isn't he? <laughs> I spent so much time on Gwyneth Paltrow's Instagram <laughs> and on her website, Goop, that now my in Instagram algorithms have gone up the spout. They're completely batshit now. The adverts I'm getting are completely crazy. I got an advert not that long ago for a deodorant for your vulva. Yeah, they didn't have the decency to call it a vulvodorant. <laughs> Absolutely livid. That wasn't the worst thing about it. The craziest thing about it was that it was an aerosol. <laughs> Who in their right mind is aerosoling their badge? <laughs> I'm 
in a roll-on, sure, we could all lean into that. <laughs> Every cis woman knows there's not a woman in the world that needs to deodorise her vulva. Yeah? And if, as one of those cis women, you find yourself in your bedroom alone, yeah? Maybe you're getting undressed, yeah? And you find yourself thinking, You've got to get to a GP quick smart. <laughs> You're going to need some hardcore. There's not enough flat for breeze in the world that's going to sort that shit out, yeah? You need some drugs, okay? <laughs> you tossers. Impulsive personality, and I and I became, you know, obsessed with Gwyneth Paltrow and her bloody website Goop. I spent 17 hours on it. I felt completely gaslit by it. I was like, come on, Gwyneth, there's got to be something here for me. Because if you don't know what Goop is, it's her flagship website. It's a lifestyle. It's a health. It's a well-being website for women. <laughs> it's everything a woman doesn't need on one website. I know. I've checked it out for you. Okay. <laughs> The kind of shit that's on there, you're like, what is this? I, th I thought, you, what the fuck is this, Gwyneth? What are you, what are you peddling, my lovely? I found a no makeup makeup routine. <laughs> is this on? <laughs> Can you hear me? I just said there was a no makeup makeup routine. <laughs> the idea being that you buy all of this makeup, you put your makeup on your face, and it looks like you're not wearing makeup. <laughs> I'm a 48-year-old lesser, I've been doing that my entire life, and so far it has cost me fuck all. <laughs> Trying to find something in there that I could make use of. Well, I'm going to cut the tension in the room here, because I know I've created it, so now it's time to cut it. I found something, you'll be relieved to hear, that I could make use of. I found myself a yoga mat, and I thought, fine. So maybe it's a lot of you have got yoga mats. I've got one. You don't have to spend a lot of money. You can spend £10, £15, something like that. You can pick one up. I don't know, somewhere like Sports Direct or Decathlon or somewhere like that. Well, you can buy one on Goop, yeah? 55 pounds. <laughs> yeah, I thought, okay. Okay. <laughs> okay, fine, okay. Well, but I've already got one. But, so if I'm gonna buy this one, this one's obviously gonna be doing something more than the one I've got, because what did you do on a mat? You sort of lie on it, roll around on it, do your stretches on it, but this is obviously gonna be doing more than the one that I'm currently doing, because otherwise, why would I be spending 550% more than the yoga mat that I've already got, currently got? Because if I'm gonna spend 550% more on a yoga mat than the one that I've currently got, I want something more from that yoga mat. Do you know what I mean? I wanna have something extra. I want extra from the yoga mat, Gwyneth. I want fucking extra. I tell you what I want. When I'm doing downward dog, I want a little- My entire family and I are actually world champion foosball players. Uh, thank you. Thank you. I know it sounds made up. I swear it's real. My parents met playing at a professional foosball tournament in the 80s. So I literally wouldn't exist if it weren't for foosball. <laughs> Which is sad. Uh, but you know, some of you wouldn't exist if it weren't for boxed wine. So it's like, yeah, whatever. <laughs> We're all a little garbage. Let's not judge each other. It gets weirder, not only is my dad a pro foosball player, he's also a slam poetry champion. <laughs> and an international yo-yo man. <laughs> yeah, my dad has the sex appeal of a fanny pack. <laughs> Crushing it. And my mom is in the foosball hall of fame and they've been training me to play since I was like two years old. But since no one suspects that I'm a pro foosball player, I love to hustle people. Right? And so I usually play against other comedians on my web series, but we did this special episode where I went undercover in Vegas and I hustled drunk dudes on the Vegas Strip. <laughs> so I wore this low cut top, I talked in the worst voice, and my camera crew and I would go up to groups of guys and I'd go, Hi, um, my name's Kelsey and I have this web series where I do things that I've never done before for the first time. <laughs> Um, it's called Pop My Cherry. <laughs> it's silly, you know. Um, so, 
I've never played foosball before, and we just found this table, and I was just wondering if you guys want to play me. <laughs> and every group of guys is like, hell yeah, bitch, let's go. <laughs> Yeah, play right now. So I would play the first game terribly on purpose, right? I would giggle a bunch, spin the rods a lot, really build up their confidence. And then I go, okay, so I think I've got the hang of it now, and this is Vegas, so we should play for money. <laughs> and every guy would put their whole wallet on the table. <laughs> And they'd hand me the ball and go, here, you can serve first. <laughs> and that's when I pull out my foosball grip glove. <laughs> Checkmate, motherfucker. <laughs> Yeah, I've never done cocaine, but I would assume it's a similar rush. Uh, you gotta get married, right? That's what you do? Ugh. <laughs> Scary, huh? Marriage feels so antiquated. Feels like we've come so far with everything. We're still doing that thing? What are we doing? Especially uh, the ladies. Every girl I've ever dated is like, when are you gonna propose? Clock's ticking. Pop the question. Why do you want to get married so bad? What is it? Ladies, you come so far. But when it comes to marriage, you guys get kind of old-fashioned. I want the ring and the cake and the dress. What? Grow up. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies, you're killing it. Go frolic. Be free. But it's my special day. All right, why do I have to ruin mine? <laughs> I don't know. I feel like a lot of guys look at marriage the way women look at anal. You know, we're both just like, well, we all knew this day was coming. <laughs> Let's get it over with. I'm not sure it's even natural. Right? <laughs> Either way, when it's all done, we'll get new sheets. <laughs> but that's why you ladies are brilliant. You gals are geniuses, because you guys tend to be the ones who want to get married to somebody who designed it to where the man asks you. That's some Jedi-level trickery right there. You're like Yoda. I want to get married, but you'll ask me. Yes, you got it. And you'll get down on one knee. No problem. And you'll buy me an expensive ring. we Will do. And whose idea was this? All mine. <laughs> well played, ladies. Well played. See, like, guys, we got to cool it with the sexual aggression. We come on too strong, we're creepy, we're scary. Ladies, you guys got to cool it with the commitment aggression. That's where you guys push. That's where you guys get creepy. When you exchange key, when you going to move in, when you get married, it's like, whoa, hey, no means no. <laughs> Slow down, I feel pressured, I'm not ready. Uh. And your family jumps in, hey, when are you going to make an honest woman out of my daughter? What? Who's this guy? <laughs> Imagine my dad did that, hey, when are you going to bang my son, huh? <laughs> Back off. I don't know, my nuts, marriage just feels like the least romantic thing on the planet. It's legal. You gotta go to a courthouse, get a license. What's the license for? That's the only license we don't check, by the way. Driver's license, liquor license. People check a fishing license. I'm gonna start checking marriage license. <laughs> Next time I see a short, broke, weird guy, he's like, that's my hot wife over there. I'll be like, let me see some ID. <laughs> <laughs> I don't buy it. I just got my license renewed. You know what's weird? When you buy alcohol, you show your driver's license. Isn't that weird? The thing I'm not supposed to do with this stuff, you want me to prove I can do? Huh. <laughs> By that logic, when you buy a gun, you should show your marriage license. <laughs> right? Lady walks in, I'll take that revolver. Guy's like, let me see some identification. Why, you've been married 60 years? You know what? Just take it. <laughs> uh -huh. I don't know. Then you gotta have kids. Ooh. Kids are scary. I like babies. Babies are fun. You know why babies are great? Because they're not evil yet. There's a million douchebags out there, but you never assume that baby will become one. Isn't that nice? That's why no one ever goes up to a pregnant woman, rubs her belly, and goes, ooh, this one's gonna suck. <laughs> no, it's all up. It's all potential. It's all positive. Oh, it's kicking. Might be a pro soccer player. Right? It's never like, oh, it's kicking. Might hit his wife. <laughs> Statistically, way more likely than a pro soccer player, right? Plus, it's already hitting a woman. Not even out yet. Mm. Uh-huh. Yeah. I don't know. I got to figure something out. Being in a relationship is always tough, you know? I've always had people say weird stuff to me like, Mark, you're a comedian. Must be a great boyfriend. Why do you say that? Well, women love funny guys. All right, well, you're taking the one singular positive aspect. If you do it with any guy, they could be, seem like a great boyfriend. Serial killer. Take out the killing. This guy's organized and cleans up after himself. <laughs>
terrorist. Check out the terrorized guy's passionate, loves to travel. <laughs> Child molester. Check out the molesting. This guy's got a van and can't wait to start a family. <laughs> yeah. I just got a bad brain. I'm too literal. Literal is bad with dating and stuff. I had a blind date once right when the girl saw me. She goes, hey, I bet we'd have really cute kids. I was like, all right, I bet we'd have great sex. And she goes, whoa, slow down. I was like, slow down, you're nine months ahead of me. <laughs> ah, this girl hated me. She was like, you know, I feel very brave tonight. I was like, why is that? Because I'm not wearing any makeup. I was like, how's that brave? Because I'm being my true self, being the real me. I was like, oh, okay. She's like, you should be brave. I'm like, yeah, maybe I will. She's like, what are you going to do? I was like, I'm going to stop pretending this is interesting. <laughs> She was like, wow, I can't believe you just said that. I was like, yeah, took guts. <laughs> I don't know. Working on it, trying to get better. I don't know. I realize I'm a weirdo. I remember I had a one-night stand once. Went great, fun night, hanging out. But during the sex, she did a new one I'd never seen before. She acted like a four-year-old. You ever come across this? We'd be having sex. I don't know where she'd be like, you know, if you want to, you can pull my hair. I was like, eh. <laughs> then we keep going, you know, if you want to, you can slap my ass. I was like, you got it. And I keep going, you know, if you want to, you can choke me. I was like, I do. Well, and we finished, we had a great night, we're laying there, and I was like, you know, if you want to, you can leave. <laughs> she didn't care for that one. I thought the uh, timing was perfect, you know. A lot of girls get mad about the whole leaving thing, but it's nothing personal against you, lady. I'm just a weirdo. I'm in my head. I'm a nut. I'm an introvert. I got to get out of there. A lot of girls get mad, like, what, do you just bang me and leave? <laughs> well, yeah, this was a long night. <laughs> I've been trying to win you over like nine hours. I'm exhausted. There were five guys at the bar hitting on you. I'd outcharm them, be more interesting, be conversational, be funny, be on all night. She was like, what? You could have just been yourself. I'm like, what are you fucking stupid? <laughs> be myself? What? I'm an idiot. If I was myself, I'd be like, hey, you fat whore, let's fuck. Ah. <laughs> That's not going to work. She was like, well, I don't get it. Why do you want to leave? Like, I don't know. I just want to go talk to somebody. Well, why not talk to me? I just want to go talk to a friend. She's like, well, you can tell me anything. I'm like, well, that's not true. She's like, I swear to God, you can tell me anything you want. I was like, all right, well, I uh, recently had sex with a woman, and she won't let me leave. <laughs> so that ended. What is that with the leaving, ladies? That one really hits a nerve with you guys. Ladies, you want a guy to stay, make him want to stay. Like, guys, we have pickup lines. Ladies, you need stay put lines. That's where you kick in. It's okay. I approached you at a bar. I was nervous. I was on my heels, shucking and jiving. I made it work. Now, you want me to hang out, so you do it. Isn't that justice? She's like, well, you're not being that fun right now. I'm like, I know I already did that. That's how I fucked you. <laughs> but now you want me to stay, so you go. It's just a shift change. That's all. Win me over. Charm me. Sweep me off my feet. You do it. I don't get it. Girls are always like, I want this guy to like me. You push your boobs together, wear high heels, you look sexy as hell. Then a guy is sexy, you're like, that's it? Well, that's what was advertised. It's very confusing. You tricked me. Your outfit's like a movie trailer. I'm like, oh, I want to see that movie. I go see the movie, then I go home. <laughs> I don't sit around going, I got to get to know this theater. <laughs> and I'm not saying the theater sucks or... Anything's wrong with it, just wasn't advertised. <laughs> Talk to me. I'd love to go. I had a girl once, you can't leave, you fucked me. Well, is this, is this how you get people to hang out with you? <laughs> how about a conversation, anecdote, knock knock, something? Ladies, you do Kegels, tighten up those stories. <laughs> I don't even get why this is so controversial. I'm just tired. I'm exhausted. I've been bringing the heat all night. I've been playing the hits. I'm exhausted. I want to go. She's like, well, how could you be fake all night? I'm like, well, you faked it too. You don't look like that. You're wearing makeup. We're both full of shit. Your eyes don't go, ugh, at the end or whatever. <laughs> We're both lying. I'm just wearing makeup up my personality. That's all. <laughs> I don't know. Like, ladies, you know when you go out to dinner with a guy, you're like, just because you bought me dinner doesn't mean I owe you sex. And that's true. But just because you let me have sex with you doesn't mean I owe you my morning. <laughs> right? It's the same exact transaction. Equality. That's why it's weird women go, we're just as horny as men. Yeah, maybe. We have a lot more requirements, ladies. Quite a checklist. You're like the Goldilocks of dick. This guy's too short. This guy's too dumb. This guy's just right. Guys, we'll fuck the porridge. <laughs> and I'm not saying one is better or worse, just different. We, I go to the doctor. He's like, what happened? I was like, it was too hot. <laughs> I got a news resolution, and it's kind of a little controversial. You ready for it? No more bullshit. No more bullshit. No more. Bullshit. No more. Bullshit. I say no more. Bullshit. No 
more bullshit. I went into a, a restaurant to get a cheeseburger the other day. I said, can I get a cheeseburger? This guy behind the counter goes, oh, well, we only have veggie burgers, man. <laughs> With Brussels sprouts and this and that and uh, turkey, uh, not turkey, uh, fuck. <laughs> I didn't get an education, the system failed me. All I got was vague advice. Be yourself, I'm a wretch. <laughs> Never give up, please. <laughs> Follow your dreams, they're illegal. <laughs> I have an incredibly settled home life, right? And it's nice, but I wish it was more exciting sometimes. And the other day I was talking to this comedian, she's much cooler than me and she has a really cool dating life. And she said, oh, so I'm dating Jack and his girlfriend now. I'm in a throuple. Like she was getting a new kitchen. <laughs> <laughs> and for some reason, to keep up with the Joneses, I said, Connor and I are thinking of becoming a throuple. <laughs> <laughs> Went home that night, sitting in bed next to him. He's reading the latest interest rates on moneysavingexpert.com. <laughs> And I said, Connor, do you think, can we maybe get a new boyfriend or girlfriend? <laughs> he went, which one of your bohemian friends have you been talking to now? <laughs> what do you want to be in a frapple for? <laughs> I went, well, maybe then you'd have someone to go to park run with. Because <laughs> I hate it. <laughs> he went, fair. I've told you, stop asking me deviant things. You have this idea of yourself in your head that you're a mad slag that loves shagging when really you just like coming home to me, having dinner and cuddling. <laughs> <laughs> I went, okay. <laughs> Can we get a cat? <laughs> Can we get a cat and not fuck it? <laughs> Just a pet cat. <laughs> when people talk about compromising in a long-term relationship, that's the kind of thing they're talking about. <laughs> you start off with high aspirations, throuple, three ways, it descends to a pet that you don't even want. <laughs> I like dogs, now we're getting a cat. <laughs> anyway, I thought I can't criticise Arlene Foster for being closeted and not say I've had a few women in my time myself. So I says I was by properly, and this time I did it during a stand-up set on telly. And as I said it, I felt sick. I felt like really nervous about saying it, but everyone started clapping me for being a brave girl. They were very woke and progressive. And I was thinking, stop clapping me for being brave. Fuck off, man. It's only half gay, so it's only half brave. <laughs> I was thinking, everyone I went to school with is going to see this on telly and slag me off and say, she's just doing this because it's the easiest way of being a woke hipster. It's easier than becoming a vegan. And I'm a vegetarian, which is the bisexuality of diets. <laughs> and that's how mum and dad found out was they saw me talking about it on telly. Imagine that's how your mum finds out about all that, right? <laughs> what all that is. That's me fingering an unbelievably tall lady. <laughs> My mum phoned me up to ask me about it after the programme came out. And she asked me about it the way only a Scottish Catholic mother does, which is by not asking you <laughs> for about 10 minutes of the phone call. It was just a series of disconnected facts. Hello, Fern. I made a carrot cake today. <laughs> then I went to Zumba. Then I picked sweet peas in the garden. And then there was this terrible pause and I knew what was coming. And she went, Fern, are you a bisexual? <laughs> Imagine if that was how Holly Willoughby asked Philip Schofield <laughs> on the, the Scottish way by screaming it in his face. <laughs> I was like, yeah, mum, and you told me it was disgusting the first time you found out. <laughs> no, I didn't. How dare you? Anyway, I've changed since you were a teenager. Because I've seen the musical Kinky Boots. <laughs> <laughs> and that changed everything. <laughs> 
Isn't that amazing that art can move people <laughs> in profound ways? One of Broadway's shittest musicals, <laughs> Kinky Boots, turned my mum from being a homophobe into someone who pretends not to be a homophobe. <laughs> And I go out with women that are like my mum. They're always quite intense. Uh, they're, they're always fucking mental. And uh, I'd really judge men who say they're always going out with mental women. I think it's quite misogynistic. So can I just say at this point in the show, I met my first girlfriend in a mental hospital. So she was fucking mental. <laughs> you know, diagnosed, we both were. It was a great match. Her name was Rita. She was a tiny little skinhead butch. We were both 16 year olds in a mental hospital. You know how it goes in your teens. <laughs> you read Sylvia Plath, you go in a mental hospital. <laughs> Rita used to write me these love letters that would open with things like, who's the funniest girl in all of Willow Grove's children and adolescent psychiatric daycare unit? <laughs> it's Fern Brady. Who makes the best potato prints about her feelings in occupational therapy <laughs> on first days with Nurse Linda? <laughs> That's right, this guy. <laughs> and then there was a terrible drawing of some palm trees on a beach done in crayon, and it said, when I look into this lassie's eyes across group therapy with that bitch Nurse Fiona, I can see the sun setting on a beach. <laughs> and it's all because of that's right! What a cracking lover I am! So Rita had given me this wonderful necklace uh, along with a letter. The necklace was a very classy necklace from the Elizabeth Duke at Argos range. <laughs> oh good, some scum get that reference. <laughs> Posh people of Glasgow, Elizabeth Duke at Argos was a range of jewellery where working class people could express earnest emotions at a fantastic price. <laughs> Rhea gave me this necklace. It said something on it like, love lasts forever. Which in Rita's voice, I definitely heard as a threat. <laughs> and my mum found the letter and the necklace when I was 16 and she went nuts at me. She was like, this is disgusting. This is vile. I was mortified, like, well, I guess this is how she finds out I've been fingering girls in a mental unit on my lunch break. <laughs> I like how non-judgmental you guys are about that. You understand there's not much to do in women's psychiatric units. You learn to finger bang and you learn to play pool to an incredibly high standard. <laughs> then mum stopped shouting at me and she went, Fern. What upsets me the most is I just cannot believe you would pretend to like other girls in order to steal their jewellery. <laughs> Excuse me? <laughs> now, a few of you know what's going on at this point, right? There's a type of person who sees the whole world as straight and then they tell themselves any story to get to that conclusion. My mum's one of those. <laughs> My mum would rather tell herself a story in which I am a jewelry thief, <laughs> running some sort of a heist. <laughs> not for good diamonds, not for Chopard or Cartier diamonds. Elizabeth Duke at Argos, <laughs> 10 pound necklaces, fingering girls against my will. <laughs> <laughs> All as part of the grand jewelry thief heist <laughs> in a mental hospital. But you see how it happens, because the other thing when I was a kid called Section 28, where Margaret Thatcher said that you couldn't teach primary school kids that LGBT people exist, not teach how to give blowies or how to lick fannies, just that they exist. Right? <laughs> I'm not saying this to try and be right on, but yet when they ban teaching things like that on the curriculum, I look back and think of the amount of utter bullshit that my teachers taught me at primary school. I went to a school where there was a crucifix on the wall of the assembly hall, there to there. Teacher told us that was the actual cross Jesus died on. <laughs> Why is Jesus one foot tall? Why is his final resting place Scotland? I used to like to do this in class when I was five. I was bored, right? I'd just move my head from side to side. Something to do. Right? 
And my teacher said, you know, Fern, that's all well and good, but the brain is attached to the top of the skull and it gradually comes loose. And the more you do that, the more likely it is that your brain will collapse in your skull, killing you instantly. <laughs> Teachers are maniacs. <laughs> I had the best year of my primary school career not being taught the curriculum. When I was eight years old, I had a teacher, Mr. Curran. Mr. Curran was drunk the entire school year. <laughs> if you're a child, this doesn't register. You just think, why is this adult more fun than all the other adults? <laughs> Didn't teach us anything. Just came in every day, sat us on the carpet and told us stories about walking his three-legged dog in the woods. <laughs> now, one day, he sat us all down and he said, kids, while I was walking my three-legged dog in the woods today, <laughs> I found something very special. And he had a shoebox in his lap. No. <laughs> he just went, oh, God. I don't know what kind of school you went to. But this isn't the point in the story where he's like, it's my big willy! Now suck it, bitches. <laughs> Get your mind out the gutter. Because something beautiful is about to happen. He says, I found a little badger. <laughs> I swear to God, he opened the shoebox and a badger come out. So beautiful. Greatest thing that had happened in my childhood at that point. Every day for a year, didn't do any arithmetic, didn't do any handwriting, just had this drunk guy stoting about with a badger in a box. <laughs> One day, he said, listen, kids, I'm going out of the classroom for a bit. You're eight, you can take care of yourselves. <laughs> well, I'm down the pub. Do not get Mr. Badger out of his box. He's a wild animal. I'll get him out when I come back. I was a very good kid. I never broke the rules. However, I sat next to two very nasty boys, Lee and Kevin. They're definitely in prison now. <laughs> and I said to them, I love having Mr. Badger in class. I think he's the best thing to happen to primary four. <laughs> <laughs> Lee and Kevin turned to me. And said, this is hard to say. They said, that's, that's not a badger. That's a fucking puppet in a box, you fanny. <laughs> when Neil finds out reality isn't real! <laughs> I felt my vision go black. <laughs> the room starts spinning around me. I'm shaking my head uncontrollably. No, 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 man. Reliving the past year of my life, looking in Mr. Badger's very real eyes. <laughs> Hanging out with him every day. I said, guys, I'm eight. I'm not stupid. That's a real badger. <laughs> I said, I'll go to the front of the class now. I wouldn't normally do this, but I'll go to the front of the class and I'll take him out of his box and I'll show you how he's real. They went, you're a fucking spoon. <laughs> <laughs> if this does go to America, there's no way of translating that. <laughs> I went to the front of the class. I stood in front of the box. <laughs> Took all my strength to open it and look inside. Looked down, 100% a glove puppet on a pile <laughs> of dead leaves. <laughs> the whole school knew except for me. If you think my comedy's dark and cynical, that is the moment all hope died in my life. <laughs> And they still won't teach primary school kids that LGBT people are real. I spent a year talking to a badger that doesn't exist. <laughs> a week after this, I overheard our art teacher, Miss Christie, telling one of the other teachers as if we couldn't hear, oh yes, they let go of Jim Curran last week. It turns out he was drinking heavily on the job. And those two boys from earlier just turned to me and went, hi, Fern, guess what? We saw him walking his dog in town. It's got four legs. <laughs> Twist the knife in, why don't you? 
people in power just lie to you. <laughs> I think people are getting more progressive on sexuality because I get a lot of younger people come into my tour shows and they're so cool in terms of seeing sexuality as a spectrum and I think it's great. And I says to my wee boyfriend, now uh, people view it this way. <laughs> Could you be anywhere else on the Kinsey scale of sexuality? And he answered really earnestly. He was like, I've thought about it, but I honestly don't think I want to suck a dick. <laughs> I was like, Connor, no one likes to suck a dick. <laughs> it's just a polite thing to do. Has anybody else been in a relationship where they thought they were being cheated on? Okay. Some of you can't say anything because you're like, I'm with them right now. Sometimes guys are like, ooh, women lie too. Yeah, we do. <laughs> We're better at it though. <laughs> women are better liars, right? Because we start small, we have sweet lies, lies that keep the relationship together, you know? Stuff like, oh my God, it's so big. And, um, <laughs> ow. <laughs> And you're the first one I ever let do that, you know, stuff like that. 